You're talking about uncertainty with such certainty. You're talking about what you don't know, and yet you're able to put numbers on the extent to which you don't know it, which makes me think you do know it. So uh, the symbol is sigma, um, and it's something you'll just hear thrown away frequently uh, in reports about scientific results, where they're saying basically how significant their results are, how important they are, and you'll hear people saying this is a three sigma result, or a five sigma result, or a one sigma result. We've been hearing a lot about it with regard to the Higgs, and the uh, maybe evidence that that's the Higgs has been seen at uh, CERN, at the Large Hadron Collider, in the ATLAS and uh, CMS detectors. Um, so it's, for example, in the context of the Large Hadron Collider, where they're inching towards detecting the Higgs boson, they keep quoting slightly higher values for this quantity sigma as a way of indicating that they're getting closer and closer to a detection of it. They won't quite say, we found it, but neither will they say, we haven't found it. What they talk about is the evidence for it being there, and, and they use this kind of, this symbol sigma or standard deviation. So whenever you make a measurement, in any kind of science, astronomy, physics, whatever it is, you make your measurement, but you should also always quote an error bar on it because you never, or very, very rarely, measure something precisely. Usually there's some uncertainty with your instrumentation or whatever. So really the sigma is the size of your error bar. It's how much uncertainty there is around the measurement you actually made. Imagine you've got a big sta a stadium, a football stadium full of people, and you decide to do uh, measure everyone's height. Then you plot it. You plot the height. Uh, the number of people of a given height and you just you, you make a distribution of it right so that that distribution will be peaked at some particular height in other words m the majority of people will or most people will have this height and fewer people will have you know they'll either be taller or shorter there'll be some maximum where the average is okay so you've got your average let's say it's six foot and then now you can be asked can begin to ask questions about the distribution itself and one way you can do it is you can say, um, how many people are there uh, within 33% of that average uh, on one side and 33% on the other side? So that's around 66%. Uh, that's one sigma. So one sigma is, takes into account sort of 66% of the data around the mean. So it's the mean plus 33% plus or minus 33 percent. If I go to two sigma, you're then saying, now I want to think about, uh, around, I think two sigma is around 95 percent of the data. So you're including all these people, and, and you can count how many there are, and that, those are in the two sigma regime. Three sigma goes to 99.7 uh, percent, I think it is. So that's taking you up to three sigma. So we're, we're almost including everybody now, right? But we're at three sigma. Four sigma takes you to 99.99%. Okay, so that's, that's, surely that's everything. That's not good enough for particle physics. It's the five sigma that's the important thing for particle physics. We'll come back to it in a second. But what five sigma means is you're including 99.9999% of all the data. So there's only like... Uh, one in one million people not included in that 99.99 percent. So that, that's what sigma is. It's not very difficult. It it's kind of tells you about the distribution around the mean, and that's all it does. The mean is the average, and sig the number of sigma tells you basically the fraction or the percentage of data which is accompanied, is included around that mean. Scientists are a bit sloppy when they use these things. They're a bit careless. And so the sigma that you often hear quoted really should be associated with something where there's a particular kind of error. The most common kind of error is a thing called a Gaussian error. Um, it's the, the er you know, Gaussian distributions are a particular form of mathematical distribution. They come up all over the place, particularly in uncertainties. It's kind of the converse. Uh, you make use of it in the converse way in the science experiment. So um, in other words, you look for things that are way out in this at the tail of the distribution, so that means a large number of sigma. It's really, these things are, are a measure of how often you're prepared to be wrong, in that if you, if you publish a result when things get to this sort of 99% significance level, um, then that means that, well, one time in 100 I'm going to claim a result is true and actually it's going to be false. Uh, so it's how often you're prepared to be wrong. So at one sigma it would be, you know, you'd be wrong a third of the time and no scientist is prepared to be put up with being wrong a third of the time, you just look stupid. In this case, we're, we're looking at, we're at CERN, we're looking at the collision of protons 
and from those collisions, we, we, let's concentrate on one of the one of the routes that has led to uh, the possible discovery of the Higgs, if it's there, and that is the production of photons. So two photons are being produced at the end of the of the uh, of this collision process. Now, it, I have a model without a Higgs. So let's have the, which is the standard model without the Higgs. There are many ways the protons can collide in this model and produce two photons. And what I can do is I can end up with what uh, was effectively a distribution of the, the, the number of photons I expect as a function of the energy of the, of, the, of the system. And now I can ask, well, if I include the Higgs, what, what happens? And uh, I can calculate what I expect it to happen. But what I can also do is just do the experiment. I can just look for the photons, right? I've got these amazing detectors and I can just look for the photons. And in particular, what I can ask is, at, at any given energy, which corresponds in fact to the, to the mass of a Higgs particle, which we're, we're, we're trying to test for, I have some average value that I expect there to be for the number of photons produced. And then I have one sigma around that average value. Let, let's make up a number. Let's say we expect to see, I don't know, 1,000 photons. And then one sigma would be including 66% plus and minus, so it would be a thousand and whatever that would be. And then a two sigma would be including 95%. And I look at the data, and usually if the data is lying within that band, then I'm not too excited about it. I, it it's consistent with the background model. You, know, you shouldn't always expect to see an average, right? Because that's why you, you have an average. You have some above and some below and the average out. But every now and again, maybe you'll see something which is up at three sigma. Well, three sigma is bigger than two sigma. And then you can think, oh, that's a bit, bit higher. But you tend not to get too excited. You might think, oh, I'll keep an eye on that. And that's where we're at at the moment with the Higgs, um, in actual fact. So the, 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 the data is at, the, at this kind of 2.8 sigma level. Um, and, and what people say, those who are waiting to, you know, before you call up Stockholm and, and, uh, and, and book your flights, two sigmas not, uh, three sigmas not good enough. In fact, four sigmas not good enough, the 99.99%. What they will have to see is evidence of, distribu of, a, of, of events which are at five sigma away from that average that you would expect the model to have without a Higgs. Because when you're at five sigma, if you just think about it in terms of your underlying model, the model without the Higgs, what you're saying is, I am seeing events occurring where I would normally have expected them to occur once in every, I think it's 1.7 million times. In other words, it's rare, but I'm, built, I'm finding lots of them, and that's what they'll do. They'll aim, they'll aim to pick up lots, not just one, but quite a few of them. And when people are quoting errors on some of these very complicated experiments, like those at the LHC, where the errors they're measuring really aren't Gaussian by a very long way, because things are incredibly complicated, there's all sorts of sources of error, systematic errors, uncertainties in the modelling and so on, almost certainly the errors are not really Gaussian, but they sort of convert it into what's the equivalent if the errors were Gaussian, because that's something that scientists sort of have in their back of their heads, that if, you know, if something's significant at a one sigma level, you probably don't believe it. If it's a two sigma level, you start believing it. By the time it's four or five sigma, you say, that's pretty certain. So from what you've told me, tell me if this is an accurate statement then. If you're wanting to confirm something that you already know, hmm. you want a low sigma. If you're looking for something new, you hope for a high sigma. It's effectively like that. You, it, I don't know if you hope for it. I mean, you, you should uh, just be saying, well, whatever the data gives me, it gives me. But if, you, if your theory is you know, bang on, then of course all the data that's coming in should be perfectly consistent with what your average expectation value is. It sh you should have very few really far outliers. Uh, whereas if your theory is not the full McCoy and is not explaining everything that's going on in that uh, that regime, um, and there are other uh, important contributors to that process, then indeed, you'll, you, as you get more and more data, then more and more of these new events will emerge that your theory isn't accounting for, and they'll appear in the outlying regions of, of, of your distribution, large sigma. How can you be near near being sure about something when you don't even know if it exists or not. It's actually, I think you're looking at it the wrong way around. I think the way you have to look about, at it, if you were looking for something like the Higgs boson, what you're asking is how far am I away 
from, so you, your starting position should always be the status quo, which is we've never found a Higgs boson, so perhaps the status quo is there is no Higgs boson. And then you start getting more and more evidence that actually maybe there is a Higgs boson. And so you sort of start getting further and further away from that position of being consistent with there not being a Higgs boson. So really what you're measuring when you make a measurement with the LHC is how far is that measurement away from there not actually being a Higgs boson at all. The look elsewhere effect. Oh, Brady. I'm not, okay, here we go. Um, I might trip up on this. So what has happened here, right, they've, they've got the plots and, um, of the uh, events, so the confidence levels, versus uh, the Higgs mass, the range of Higgs masses. And the, I, I mentioned the one at about 126 GeV as being the, the one which has got the most significance. That's called a local significance because you're looking at 126 GeV. However, it could be that just random fluctuations that kind of event could have occurred at any other energy scale. It, it might have occurred at 135 GeV or 123 GeV. Or, so uh, that one itself could be an outlier from another graph. The, yes, I think that might be one way of interpreting it. And, and, and so the significance of, of assigning that high sigma to that particular energy scale then becomes diminished. And there's a statistical way of trying to account for that. And the look elsewhere just means you're looking across the band of, and the, the likelihood of this thing appearing, as you say, as an outlier from a, a, different, a different regime. That's, yeah, that's a neat way of saying it. Uh, look, I'm not you, should be, you should be here, Brady. <laughs> <laughs> Day to day, you're an astronomer, not a particle physicist, as far as I know. Yeah, indeed. Do you use sigmas? We use sigmas. Astronomers are very bad at statistics, I have to say, and so some astronomers use statistics very sloppily. Uh, I try not to, um, but astronomers do use sigmas, but I'm much more comfortable when you quote uh, something as one of these confidence levels, that you've, you've measured something at the 90% confidence level, which basically means that, you know, I, I'm pretty sure I've measured something, but there's a 1 in 10 chance I'm wrong. The whole of science is based on, in, in some ways, narrowing down the uncertainties. Um, the, what people are taught when they come in to do physics at university and now and at school, or you should be taught at school, it's not the actual value necessarily, it's the uncertainty in that value. How confident are you? You're talking about uncertainty with such certainty. You're talking about what you don't know, and yet you're able to put numbers on the extent to which you don't know it, which makes me think you do know it. It's the classic thing, right? There are known unknowns and there are unknown unknowns. There are known unknowns because we know there are limitations to our experiment. We know that we only recorded this much data and therefore the most precision we could ever get is this much and so on. So there are those things which are sort of, we really can quantify. But then there are the unknown unknowns, which is that it's possible we just set up our experiment wrong. It's possible there's something in the experiment we really don't understand. It's possible that there's some implicit approximation we've made somewhere along the line that actually has a bigger effect than we thought it did. And so those kind of things, those sort of systematic errors where we really don't know what they are, they can always be lurking there. And so even when somebody quotes a result as, you know, a Six Sigma result and therefore hugely significant, if they've missed some systematic error in there, it can still go away. And so, indeed, we have to be a little careful that when you quote an error and quote something as being incredibly improbable that you're wrong, there's always this possibility that you've just missed something entirely in the process.